Hello, coders. So, point lights are infinitesimally small sources of light. They differ from directional lighting in two major ways. First, the relative positioning between the light source and the surface points on the model now actually will matter. Unlike with directional lighting, where incoming light rays will have the same direction no matter where an object is in the scene, rays from a point light can hit a flat surface at different angles, which will affect the apparent brightness of the surface. The second major difference is point lights are typically attenuated. What this means is that the intensity of the light source drops as the distance from the light source increases. In reality, light intensity follows the inverse square law, meaning that the light intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the light source. So, an object that is twice the distance away will only receive one quarter the amount of light. Note that this is true even for light sources such as the sun. Pluto is about 50 times farther away from the sun, so at that distance, the intensity of light would be 2,500 times weaker than it is on Earth. The reason we don't attenuate directional lighting is that the light source is being treated as infinitely far away. So any small increase in distance has a negligible effect on the light's intensity. You are not constrained to making point lights follow the inverse square law. Many animation programs actually allow a constant, linear, and quadratic parameter to modify how exactly an individual light is attenuated for artistic effect. While not physically realistic, these extra parameters may enable you to get the specific look you are after. For this tutorial though, we will stick with an attenuation of just light intensity over distance squared. Okay, let's get started. In our first implementation file, we need to update the global UBO. I'm going to remove the light direction field and for the first point light object, add a position and color field. Position will have the VEC3 type, but I'm making the light color a VEC4, where the W component will store the light's intensity. You could get away with using a VEC3 and control light intensity by allowing RGB values greater than 1, but I prefer keeping the RGB values in the 0 to 1 range and being able to control the light intensity while maintaining the same values for the color components. Now, just a refresher about alignment requirements, since I feel like this is still a point of confusion for some viewers. UBO memory within shader programs will automatically align in certain ways, following the STD140 specification. Ignoring the projection view matrix, since it's 64 bytes and will already be aligned, currently the structure on the shader will look like this with a four byte gap between the end of the light position and the start of the color variable. This will happen because the specification says that VEC3 and VEC4 types need to be aligned to 16 bytes. The host's default behavior though would be to pack the memory tightly. One option to manually fix this is by adding four bytes of padding. The shader would fit this four byte variable in at byte 12 and the memory layout would be tightly packed and will also therefore match the layout on the host. Alternatively, some engines avoid ever using the VEC3 and MAT3 data types within buffer objects, and will just ignore the extra unused values. One reason to do this is that some implementations in the past have incorrectly implemented VEC3's layout rules. So even if you did everything correctly, on some devices your code would still fail. However, based on the stack overflow answer, so not exactly the best source, but this shouldn't be an issue with Vulkan because shaders are compiled to Spear 5, and this was more of a problem for older graphics APIs. And the last option would be to use the align as operator, which we can put before the color variable. Don't make the mistake of putting align as 16 before every variable. For example, if we did align as 16 before the int padding, this would be incorrect actually. We could use align as 4 here instead, but note that this doesn't work in all situations. For example, when using a nested structure, it will fill its space rounded up to the nearest VEC4 size. So using align as 4 on the host would pack the float variable too tightly, when to be correct, it would actually need to be align as 16. My point is just take your time and double check the alignment rules whenever making changes to buffer object structures. It's a common place for hard to find bugs to be introduced. Okay, let's get back on track. Add one more VEC4 member for the ambient color since currently we are just hard coding this into the shader. Set the color RGB components to white 
And then for the fourth component, just a low intensity value of like 0 0.02. Now we need to update the vertex shader with the new UBO struct definition. So navigate to your shader, remove direction to light, and add the three new fields in the exact same order as you did in the app implementation. So that will be ambient light color, light position, and light color. And now since we're passing in the ambient light color, we can get rid of the ambient constant we defined previously. For point lighting, we need to calculate the direction to the light source from the vertex. You might be tempted to try vec3 direction to light is equal to light position minus position. However, this would be incorrect. Whenever you are doing operations within a shader, you need to make sure that the values within the calculation occupy the same space. In this case, our light position is in world space, but the vertex position is still in model space. So we need to first transform the vertex position to world space by multiplying by its model matrix. Once we have the vertex position in world space, we can calculate the direction to the point light using subtraction. And don't leave out the dot .xyz postfix, since the position world is a vec4, but we only care about the first three components for this calculation. Next, let's scale the point light's color by its intensity. This would be unnecessary if we just used a vec3 type instead. And then do the same for the ambient light. We need to slightly modify the light intensity equation since unlike before, we are now providing a color value. The diffuse lighting equation then becomes the diffuse light color times the cosine of the angle between the surfaces normal and the direction to the light source, which is just equal to the dot product of the normalized vectors. So make sure to add a normalized function call on the direction to light vector. Diffuse shading was first covered back in tutorial 18. Then we can finally calculate the output color as just the sum of the diffuse light plus our ambient light times the color of the surface. And that's it. We can build and run and the vase objects will now have slightly different lighting being applied. But we haven't yet taken into account attenuation. Right now the intensity of the light will be the same regardless of the vase's distance to the light source. So in the vertex shader, we can add an attenuation factor equal to the inverse square of the distance. Okay, there are two things to note here. The dot product of any vector with itself is an easy and efficient way to calculate the length of the vector squared. And secondly, make sure to calculate your attenuation factor before you normalize the direction vector. Otherwise, your distance will always equal 1. Then multiply the light color by the attenuation. Recompile your shaders and run your code. And our vases are looking a little dark, so let's move them a bit closer to the light source. Rather than change the light's position, I'll scroll down to the load game objects function and set their Z components equal to zero. And now that I've moved the vase objects closer to the camera, we should also adjust the viewer object's starting position to be just a bit further back. By setting the translation.z value to negative 2.5, the camera will now have moved back an equal distance. Now, the vase objects are looking a bit better. The point light's position is slightly closer to the vase on the left. So if you look closely, you should be able to tell that it is brighter than the vase on the right. Unfortunately, we can't yet see the point light, but I think it should be right around this area here. The last change I'd like to make today is to add in a floor object. For this, we'll use a simple square model made up of two triangles. So create a quad.obj file within the models directory, and then I've provided a paste bin link containing the model's data. In the load game objects function, create a new object that uses the quad model. I'll call my game object floor and set its initial translation to 0, 0 0.5, and 0. The scale can be whatever positive values you like. I'll keep it at 3, 1, 3. Note that the Y scale value doesn't actually matter at all since all the model's Y components are already zero. Finally, move the floor to your list of game objects, run your code, and you should get a floor object perfectly placed at the bottom of the vase objects. If we zoom out even just a bit though, the models start to get clipped by the far clipping plane. I used a very conservative value for this when we first set up the projection matrix. 
so you will probably want to increase this to a value of 100 or even 1000. And that's it for this one. Next we'll cover fragment versus vertex lighting, which will fix why the floor object doesn't look quite correct. So I've been thinking of making some small changes to how I make these tutorials. As we move to more intermediate level content, implementing a feature isn't quite typically possible within a single video, unless I make it very, very long. So to make my life a bit easier, I'm going to start breaking things up into shorter videos. This should also make possible a regular weekly posting schedule, which from what I hear is good for the YouTube algorithm. <laughs> anyway, I'll try to target like the 8 to 15 minute range. Each tutorial will be contained within a single video, but features will be implemented over the course of multiple tutorials. And if you want to peek ahead to the end result, you can go to the GitHub repo and check out the point lights branch that is already there. This version of the repo contains the code for the completed feature within the tutorial subdirectory. Note that this is just preliminary code and the final version covered within the actual videos will likely contain some changes. So if you test this out ahead of time, please provide feedback on the Discord. I really hate when bugs manage to make their way into a video and I think this is actually a pretty good way to prevent some of that. I also started adding in more of a directory structure, so if that makes building the project difficult for you, let me know, especially if you're using your own build process, since feedback ahead of the videos can give me time to change things to work as smoothly as possible on most platforms for when I actually get to implementing these in the tutorial series. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you liked this video and the new format, please leave a comment or a like on the video. Keep on coding. Cheers.